the um, I'm going to go the share screen I function is on is below on the on the Zoom screen. The yeah, group. I click that in. Do you see my desktop now? Nope. That's funny. We just did this a couple of minutes. Okay. Ago. How's that? There you go. That's it. Are we in? Here we go. There <laughs> so good morning and good evening. It's actually very interesting that part of what I talk about here it does uh, involve time. So here we are in our opposite sides of the planet experiencing dark and light at the same time a lovely expression of non-duality which is very much part of my uh, uh, my work so here you see that i've uh, put up this quote from rumi which i really love and actually is very appropriate for this talk um, because in a sense this is exactly what has happened to me throughout these years as you start to walk on the way, the way appears. I mean, we could spend a whole a whole hour or two discussing just the meaning of that. It's just such a beautiful way to say that let things be, what appears appears, trust in the process, um, give life the chance to give you all the opportunities that it wants to. Uh, life is not against us. It's actually there totally for us. And um, I think that when we let go and allow, then it gives a chance for our potential, um, what we can do, what we are meant to do, not meant to in the sort of sense of duty or something oppressive, but uh, what we came here, what we chose to be here for. When we just walk that path and allow it to be, then it really does happen. And I can say that with a surety because it has happened to me in that way. I suppose one of the questions here is why would I um, kind of not give up, but let go of this very Western way that we tend to orient our lives, which is... Um, we need to choose. I'm in the driving seat. I've got to do something with my life. I need to achieve something. And uh, my objective is this. And uh, what's what's the plan A? What's the plan B? What's the five year plan? What's the 10 year plan? All of that. Anyway, I'm not going to go off on a tangent on this, but uh, just to set the scene, really, because the magician magician's jewel is a result of um, decades of living, of experiencing, of learning, of meeting, of uh, gathering, and of really, really trusting the process of really allowing what is to be. And even when things seem to be a bit weird, well, it's happening. So just let it happen <laughs> kind of thing. So here is, um, I want to play this uh, to you, this uh, video that I've got here. And now I hope that, um, in fact, I'm just gonna go out of the show just a second. I know that I have to enable um, the content in order. Oh, I think it's okay, I'll be able to show it. Okay, here we go. So I'd like to just play this little video to you, which is uh, The Magician's Jewel. Um, you may be asking, what is The Magician's Jewel? Well, this, what you see on your screen, is The Magician's Jewel, as I have named it, or rather as it has asked me to name it, <laughs> in a sense. And I'm going to be describing this piece of work, this installation that I made. I'm going to be describing this to you and how I made it throughout this talk. But first of all, I'm just going to show you exactly what I'm talking about. Here it is, one minute of a piece by piece construction of this uh, piece of work that I made just to um, allow you to see its, uh, its process. Here we go.
I'll just uh, pause it there, otherwise it's going to continue playing. I hope you could see the video okay. I hope that the transmission was okay via the Wi-Fi. Uh, Judy? Said, can I ask you a question, Susan? What is the scale of this? How okay. big? Well, actually, that's not a defined um, um, answer yet. But the, uh, the very simple answer to that is as large as possible. Because participants are going to actually uh, walk around on this as an exhibition piece. So, for example, you're going to understand when I um, um, go into more explanation about the p of the or the individual parts of it that this uh, the, these two wings on the side. This is a park. These are pools of water. These are peninsulas sticking into pools of water. These are um, um, rocks or stones which are lining the side. These are um, this this large piece that this large central structure that you see is uh, um, has got this spiral on it, which participants are going to climb up and go into its inner parts, in, inner chambers and its little tunnels and its little. And there are so many aspects to it. So the answer to your question is not yet defined, but if I could find a location that uh, would allow it, I would want it to be at least 100 feet high. So really, this talk is going to be an introduction to the Magician's Jewel. I know I've already said a few things about it uh, so far, but the Magician's Jewel itself really has four parts. And um, in this talk today, we're going to be focusing on its outer and inner aspects whereas also there's a secret and heart essence. Now, why do I use these terms? Because when um, we study in the Tibetan Buddhist Vajrayana tradition, the diamond path of the highest yogic tantras of Tibetan Buddhism, uh, there are always these four aspects. There's an outer, there's an inner, there's a secret and a heart essence. And as a student you will be introduced to each of these stage by stage because of course you need to pierce the layers you need to come from the outside in and um, so I've broken down the uh, working draft that I have of this uh, project into these four aspects here you can see for example um, let me get my pointer up um, here we go Oh no, sorry. Are you seeing my arrow? I, my arrow is I saw it once and I don't you see it right now, but. My arrow is by the, where it says outer inner secret and our heart essence. Yes, I see it, I see it now. Yeah, I see it, okay, good. Cause otherwise I'll be pointing to myself. <laughs> so for example, when we talk about the outer, we're looking at this, this park and this spiral and the little platforms, the 12 platforms that the, the participants will, will stand on on their way up. And when we talk about the inner, we're looking at this mechanism, the divine Vajra, which is forms the axis of this uh, of the structure. When we talk about secret, we're looking at what's inside this uh, toroidal field that we see here in the center of the divine Vajra, which here you see the inner part of. 
And then when we talk about the heart essence, we go inside this uh, dodecaricosahedron shape here. And here in the right hand corner, you'll see some of the energetic operations that are happening inside this uh, structure. So I'm just going to rattle off a few um, topics that uh, the Magician's Jewel covers, starting with uh, Plato's five element shapes. Obviously, you can see some of these in the in the installation. Universal harmonics. Well, again, you can see this already because these uh, down here I'm showing you on the left hand side, these stones which turn into flower beds which turn into stones, and again, you've got on this side, are actually arranged in octaves of harmonic resonance. And I'll go into that a, a little, with a little more detail in a minute. Then it's uh, an explanation of the Tibetan Book of the Dead, which is known as the Bardo Todol in uh, the Tibetan language. And actually the Tibetan Book of the Dead is really a wrong uh, interpretation of the uh, Bardo Todol. The Bardo Todol actually, um, explains the process of existence and um, not only I mean on the surface it's like an allegory the process of existence is actually um, a way to explain how our consciousness actually functions and it's more subtle uh, subtle allegory but I'll come into that again I'm going to elucidate these uh, points in further slides lucid dreaming well, at the base of the uh, structure, we are going to enter into a chamber underneath the mirror, which is the bardo of sleep. Bardo means um, one of the spaces of consciousness and uh, existence that the bardo Tudor talks about. And inside that bardo of sleep, we're going to learn about lucid dreaming. Sound, so we have outside acoustics playing and also within binaural headphones. So when you enter into the installation as a participant, the first thing you're going to be given is a kind of a head, a helmet, which has these um, this connection to uh, prominent parts of your brain waves. And I'll come on to get again, I'll come on to that a, a little bit more in, in a later slide. And um, you're going to also have headphones attached. So as you walk through the park and as you experience these different stages of the of existence, you will be given instructions. Um, so similar in the Bardo Total, there are a lot of instructions like um, now you are. I love this one. Now you are dead. Do not be afraid. Nothing can kill you because you are already dead. <laughs> this is a beautiful instruction. I really like that one. And things like, um, oh, the appearances that you see around you, these are nothing but your own uh, reflections of your mind. And um, do not be afraid. Uh, look at the meaning of, the, of your mind at its core. And then you will see that actually all of this is an expression of the clear light state of existence, blah, 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 blah. So these kind of instructions you're going to find in the Bada Todo. A lot of you are probably familiar with the Tibetan Book of the Dead and may have, may have read it in the past. So sound, there will also be outside acoustics. There's an ohm chamber here at the top of the uh, structure. Again, I'll at least state on that in a minute. Then light, we've got uh, laser lights and um, we've got optics and mirrors. Well, you, you've already seen in the video that there's a mirror at the base of the structure which uh, uh, reflects the entire main part of the magician's jewel into itself so you've got rather than just a four-sided pyramid you've actually got an octahedron if you look at both the reflective space and the actual space as one as one shape sacred geometry well that uh, speaks for itself you can see here cubes and triangles and tetrahedrons and all the rest of it biogeometry well that's a huge subject and i think a lot of you who are here are familiar with biogeometry um, which is uh, really where we access the subtle uh, energy in, um, and are able to f firstly be able to measure it and secondly be able to adjust it uh, so that it's beneficial for ourselves and uh, all biological uh, 
um, beings. Of course, biodramaturgy has got a lot more to it, but I always think of it as this core um, creating this beneficial energy, this BG3 for um for 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 the well-being of of all um, all creatures and uh, nature, anything that's alive, anything that's uh, attached to source, anything that's natural. Magnetism, and I've got here magnet motor question mark. Now, magnetism is not one of my great uh, knowledge points, so I am uh, searching people who are going to help me with that. But I have an inkling. Uh, my intuition, a lot of this has been uh, devised by me into my intuition, and my intuition does tell me that magnetism is involved here. Crystals, well, I have uh, um, done quite some research into uh, crystals. Not, I, I'm not an expert by any means, but I've researched the subject so that um, I'm able to, um, you see here that, oops, sorry. You see here that um, the, the the four crystals above this main um, I, dodecaricosahedron and these four crystals down to the base. So we've got eight crystals and this central part. And then reflected into the mirror, you'll see also the crystals. So in a sense, there are 16 crystals, but there are eight actual crystals. And um, when I say here, which ones to suit the purpose? Uh, crystals are not to be messed with. I mean, we can't just shove crystals together and hope they'll all get on <laughs> as friends. And especially when uh, we've got uh, piezoelectricity going on. Again, I'll come on to that in a minute. So again, here we go. Electricity, um, <clears throat> the aspect of a standing columnar wave with its solitron grid. Uh, here you will see uh, this in effect, and I'm again, I'm going to talk about this more in a minute, will become the standing columnar wave. And this is the solitron grid. Uh, we're also creating um, an implosion to source at the center of this um, through using, uh, bringing the energy to the center and then imploding it through a cone shape at the correct angle and correct positioning of wave formation down to um, a central point, which uh, should, by all means, convert Hertzian waves, you know, the sinusoid sinusoidal waves, which are going um, from A to B, B to C, C to D, taking time and effort into um, a longitudinal wave, which pulses immediately everywhere. It's a completely different uh, dimensional state of, uh, of waveform. And um, we could call it the octave above uh, the Hertzian wave form that we are usually using in our emotional state as a human being. Again, more on that in a minute. Piezoelectricity. Um, are you all right taking questions as you go or would you rather have them at the end? I, I, I don't mind. The only thing about questions in the middle is the answer may be coming. <laughs> so. Okay, so Jerry has raised his hand. <clears throat> okay, well, go let's, ahead. Let's yeah, let go him, ahead. I'll, I'll tell him. you. I'll tell you if the answer's coming, or if I I should tell you now. Yeah, sure. Okay. Go ahead. All right, go ahead, uh, Jerry. You just unmute yourself. Can you unmute yourself? Yeah, I didn't have a question, uh, so I'm not sure why my <laughs> uh, uh, I didn't raise a hand. Oh, you didn't raise a hand. Okay, maybe you got re maybe I got clicked by accident. Sorry about I that. See. Okay, great. Well, then we will just continue. Anyhow, nice to hear you, Jerry. <laughs> so yes, we go on to vortices uh, or vortexes, um, and you will see that here on the left we have this uh, toroidal field. Again, we have three toroidal fields going down the axis, but we'll come on to that in a minute. Metals. So, which kind of metals would we use to create the structure? Obviously, the metals and the crystals, they have a relation with each other. So we have to think about that very carefully. The layout of the park, um, which I just mentioned, uh, has pools of water and uh, these uh, peninsulas with these uh, um, whirling structures here. Actually, there are 16 of these whirling points, and these represent bliss wheels. Bliss wheels in the highest tantric yogas uh, refer to our level of bliss, means um, running from the lowest one, which would be absolute depression, which is basically death, uh, through different levels of joy, 
to the higher state of joy, which is enlightenment. Um, this is a very important process because as we increase our bliss, so we increase our levels of compassion, our wisdom, our higher qualities. It's a way that we can climb the staircase uh, to uh, become our higher potential. Now we have movement, um, Hopi rain dance angles. Um, I'll talk about that more in a minute. Medicine wheels and the motion of human beings on the uh, on the machine on the device on the installation i'm never quite sure what to call the magician's jewel i mean it's an first and foremost it's an ex an installation piece for an exhibition but not just a pretty picture or not just a pretty image it's a uh, something that has a function it's a device it operates it works it's uh um, not only something that interacts with our human consciousness because it's having an effect on us as we participate and go through the uh, through the installation, it's also um, um, giving out its own energy. It's going to be created in a way there that it has multi-purpose in that sense, as an exhibition piece, as a device, as something useful, and plus as a sort of educator and uh, to help people to, to, to understand the nature of existence. Augmented reality and virtual reality cinematographic development. Well, you see here on the top left, I've got this, uh, I sh show you here the central part. This is the very, um, th th this is actually called the um, labyrinth of the sacred bardo. And here are three sections, the three sections that are talked about in the Tibetan Book of the Dead, Bada Toro, um, where at the beginning of the Bada Toro, we enter into the Bardo of Death. And here you can see a Fibonacci spiral coming around in seven steps, its eighth being the entrance into the next one, um, which is also an octave. Then we have here within the dodecai cosahedron that you see inside the cube here, we have um, the bardo of reality. And again, that will take us through an octave of harmonic re resonance, which also um, um, the, these numbers are also present in the bardo total as uh, they're not talked about as octaves, but they correspond to numbers that relate to octaves. And then you have here this white uh, Fibonacci spiral coming out, which again is an octave of harmonic resonance and uh, relates to the bardo of becoming. So we've got the bardo of dying, and we've got the bardo of reality and the bardo of becoming. So dying, what's in between, and then rebirth. Um, the e, so, oh, sorry, I hadn't talked about the augmented reality and virtual reality element. So as a participant on the structure, once you've climbed up to the top of the structure around the spiral, um, the spiral part of it, which is actually a travelator, so it will take you up to the top. There's an ohm chamber at the top, and then after the ohm chamber, you come down into this uh, black Fibonacci spiral, bardo of death, bardo of reality, bardo of becoming, that takes you back down to the park again. But these, during the pathway of these three parts, uh, inside the black Fibonacci spiral, which is the bardo of death, you will don, um, you know, you've got this... Uh, um, augmented reality co combined with virtual reality glasses and this will be an augmented reality effect so along with the helmet that you're wearing which is measuring your brain waves uh, the predominant uh, emotion that you are experiencing at that moment will be augmented into your uh, space around you so if you're like predominantly in the space of anger you'll start seeing nasty creatures around you. If you're predominantly in the um, sort of God's realm type uh, um, space, then you'll start seeing angelic uh, creatures. And if you're in the human realm, well, you'll see kind of uh, other, you know, humans. And um, there are six six realms mentioned in the Bardo Tudor. I'm just rattling off these ones. You may think where I'm getting these names from, but there's the God's realm, there's the demigod's realm, there's a the human realm. There's the animal realm, there's the hungry ghost realm, and there's the hell realm. So all of these realms pertain to one of our emotions. And as we're walking through this section of uh, these three, these three sections of the magician's jewel, um, you will see your own 
predominant aspect in the space around you. So even if you were to change emotion, for example, then the visuals around you in your augmented uh, reality picture would also change. Virtual reality. Now, once we get inside the icosododecahedron, then we are going to see, um, we're going to switch to virtual reality here, and we are going to be able to move at will throughout the entire structure. So, you know, you can be sitting there in the center of it, which is a kind of chamber, and you can move yourself up and down the frame, you can go along the different tunnels, you can stand on different parts of it. You couldn't do this in reality, of course, you couldn't just go and like hang off one of the one of the um, parts of the of the device, uh, you, but you can do that in the virtual reality world. And also it's going to take you into a space where you're going to see the um, the images that are described in the Bada Tudal as being the uh, what you would see in your in the space bet between the last stages of death and before you would go into rebirth. So the Bada of reality is where we see our mind naked, and uh, there is the introduction of uh, the hundred peaceful and wrathful deities, as uh, as they call it. And um, again, I'm going to come on to this this later in more detail. Um, I've already mentioned the EG helmet and headband and the intervention of human consciousness. Well, there are a lot of uh, there's a lot of space for human uh, humans to intervene here, some of which I've already mentioned. Now, um, how it started? Well, sorry, I thought there was another page in between there. How it started? Um, I have to. I mean, it started when I was born, before I was born. I mean, we can't ever give a date to when things start, but we always have to pick a time or moment in space because uh, there must be one prominent place that uh, that uh, says it all. And here we are in Nepal at the Bodhanath Stupa in Kathmandu, where I had the very, very great fortune to meet uh, His Eminence Chubhutrujan Rinpoche, who was one of the great, great old masters, very old school, traditional uh, masters of Tibetan Buddhism and spent six years studying with him. Um, I lived right next to the stupa here. In fact, I can even show you on this picture on the right, this back here, I had a balcony here, <laughs> up here, and I would wake up in the morning and um, be able to see the stupa right in front of, uh, out of my window. Um, it was a wonderful, wonderful place to live. And definitely, I noticed when I went back this uh, this Christmas and New Year, I have been somehow heavily influenced by this place and this stupa, and of course uh, the teachings and the experience I had with the very great masters here. Um, you'll see this stupa. This is one of the most uh, holy stupas uh, in the whole of the Himalayan region for Buddhists, for Hindus, for. Um, other people, I mean, it, it, it attracts you whether you're religious or spiritual or not. It's just uh, majestic and awe inspiring. And you see these shapes, it's just uh, shapes within shapes within shapes, and the level of BG3 and the level of uh, life force coming out of this. And uh, the people are, are, are circumambulating it all the time. You'll never find a place, a, a time when there's not one person. Um, turning around this uh, this stupa so it's generating generating and generating energy I'm just it's enormous it's really something you have to experience in order to really understand and um so this period of time was really a very very uh, influential part of my life so i I mentioned Rinpoche here not just because he became my uh, root teacher and uh, guided me through the uh, stages of the path during those years. At one point, he sent me on a journey to a valley high up in the Himalayas. Now, it's not like uh, you have to do everything your guru tells you, like, uh, you know, yes, sir, no, sir, three bags, full, sir, kind of thing. You obviously can make your own decision and choose for yourself if your guru says, look, uh, I suggest that you, if you have, as he put it to me, if you have the time and if you have the money, please go and do a retreat in this valley high up in the Himalayas. I mean, I could have said, no, I don't want to do that. And OK, fine. It could have been, uh, you know, 
I could have done something else. But uh, when your guru says something a bit out of the way like this, you usually sit up and listen. And, okay, okay. And one of the things he told me when I was leaving is uh, take photographs, which is like I was going to do a retreat and he's telling me to take photographs. Okay. Um, and ironically, in inverted commas, um, another Lama who I was very good friends with and who I had actually already traveled to this valley with some years before, on that trip, my whizzy, lovely digital camera, which those days were quite new, um, had broken. It had like fallen off a random ledge. And so he had given me, when I came to live in Nepal, he had given me this old 1960s Pentax camera that, um, I mean, it was the best of its time in the 1960s, but the light meter didn't work. And I knew nothing about click and wind and how to shutter speeds and aperture speeds, how to fix these, 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 uh, these things on. So I had a very quick lesson with a, a photographer friend who basically said, if it's dark, put it at this kind of angle. If it's a, this kind of uh, number, if it's a light, very, you know, very light object, you know, a lot of uh, sun coming on it or light on an object, then put it like this. So I had a very simple um, lesson in uh, how to take photography, um, how to take photographs, sorry. And um, so this resulted in a lot of very good mistakes. I say a lot of very good mistakes because I would get the shutter and aperture speed wrong and um, end up with rainbows pouring into valleys and um, the most incredible sort of light phenomena in the background. I'm like, how did this happen? I mean, it was almost as if I had photographed a subtle realm. And some of these pictures were, in the true sense of the word, extraordinary. I mean, not like they were brilliant photographs. The, the camera was old, the print wasn't that good, but extraordinary in the sense of having this quality of, of seeing into this subtle realm. Um, and um, there was another thing I also noticed from taking these photographs, because I didn't just take one round of photographs. I mean, I became obsessed. So there I was taking pictures of stones and trees and rocks and little flowers and like corners of mountains and this and that. But there was one very, very prominent mountain that kept appearing again and again in most of my photographs or a lot of my photographs in the background. And from one angle, it looked like this. From one angle, it looked like that. And when I had all these, yes, this is not the wrong number, 1,200 photographs that I had click and wind, <laughs> printed out. When I had printed out all these photographs and I saw all of these uh, pictures with this mountain looking different in, in each of them, I'm like, huh, this mountain is just a mountain. It's the same thing all the time. It's just a solid thing that sits there and it looks like that. But yet when I photograph it from this angle, it looks like this. When I photograph it from that angle, it looks like that. And this really got me thinking about perspective. I mean, here we have one thing and you look at it from that side, this side, that side, and this side, and it looks different from every angle. Hmm, very important. And I, I uh, entered into a very good meditation on uh, perspective after that and how it influences the way we see things in general in life. So then there I was with my 1,200 photographs back in Kathmandu. And like I mentioned, I had this lovely big room overlooking the stupa. Um, and I could actually lay down not probably not all of them, but most of these photographs across the floor of my room. And I left these little pool of spaces that I could stand in to walk through. Um, and I just left them on the floor there for one, two, three days. And as I was walking in and out of the room, certain photographs started jumping out at me. And um, then I started to, as so I gathered these photographs together, and then I started playing around with these particular photographs that had jumped out at me. And a very natural shape is a cross. And this cross formation here, the two keys, one lock, um, just started forming. At the same time, I was learning about the nature of the elements with Rinpoche, and this is very um, a very big subject in the highest yogic tantras. And um, so I started to make here, for example, on the left side. You do see my arrow, right? Yeah. Yes. 
Okay, good, because I'm just going to point out the different parts of the of, of the two keys. So here on the left, we've got the green, the wind, which is bowl shaped. Now here I'm using symbolism, which is associated with the, this uh, um, this tantric uh, path of the Vajrayana, the diamond path in Tibetan Buddhism. So we've got the bowl shape, it's green, and um, we've got the uh, triangle and it's red, and this is the fire. We've got the square and it's yellow, and this is the earth, and we've got the white and the circle, and this is the water. Now, um, so I started playing around and putting the photographs into these orders, this order, and then um, I couldn't just leave it like that. I thought, well, I've got to have some support for it, so what could I put it on? And um, I decided to try out plyboard. And then the plyboard didn't look very nice under the photograph. So I covered the plyboard with cloth and then I put the photographs on top. So photo photocollage art was not like a subject that was already there. It just developed as I was uh, trying to, as I was playing around really with these photographs. And then I liked it. I'm like, wow, I can do things with my photographs. I'd love to do an exhibition. And then I was thinking, oh, maybe I could do like a lovely big exhibition in New York or London or Paris or Milan or, you know, one of these places. But, you know, I better have a trial before I go to one of these uh, these large cities. I should uh, have a practice round. So um, I organised an exhibition in Kathmandu. And for that exhibition, because I thought that only having one picture was not... Uh, I'm sorry, I've jumped ahead here. Um, was not enough. So I played around again and I made this picture here, Pure Vision Transformed into Organized Confusion. Now, you're going to recognize already that Pure Vision Transformed into Organized Confusion looks like something that we've already seen as the base of the magician's jewel. Anyhow, so with these two pictures, I made this exhibition and I enlarged a whole load of other photographs and I had a lovely exhibition in Kathmandu. And then came the Circle of Immortality here on the bottom left. Circle of Immortality, which uh, again appeared just like this uh, over a period of about six or seven months. I started um, um, making this because I had now been invited to make a, a, a documentary about this valley I'd been to and I'd taken all these photographs in. And um, to, in order to, this is actually, Actually, where I started developing my kaleidoscopic filmmaking, as I call it, which is where I embed a shape into the timeline of the movie. So, in effect, it uh, should be transmitted to the viewer. That shape and the meaning of the shape should be transmitted to the viewer um, while watching while watching the movie. So here, the circle of immortality um, was actually created when I had this idea it came to me I should uh, I want to make the timeline dance in a way I don't want to have this sort of static a to b to c to d I want it to 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 have this uh, very movimental aspect to it how should I do that and now I was studying the nature of uh, relative and absolute reality with uh, Rinpoche and so um, I wanted to try and merge this absolute reality and relative reality into this, uh, um, into this movie. But how would I do that? Um, so I decided to make a symbol for each, a symbol for absolute reality as a circle and a symbol for relative reality as a square. So I did what I didn't know at the time is what... Uh, um, those obsessed with uh, ancient Egyptian structures have been doing forever is try and put together the square and the circle. And so I drew a square, put the circle inside, drew another square, put the circle like this, and then I cut it out. Well, I didn't cut it out yet because I looked at it and I go, if I were to cut this out, then I just have a lot of rings and I just, I would, this wouldn't work. I've got to find a way to join the outside to the inside. And so I did the most natural thing, I made a spiral. And then I cut it out. Because now I can keep, <clears throat> I can keep my structure whole, but I've now got a, um, it's now turned into a, a spiral shape. But then, you know, 
it was on the floor flat it wasn't a spiral that I could I sort of pulled it up from the middle and it became this lovely vortex that came up like this but then when I dropped it it fell back down to the ground again of course so then I made these triangles just to hold it up again this is just out of paper ordinary normal paper I'm just playing around with this in my room then friends helped me and said, oh, why don't you do use this kind of material for the spiral, this kind of material for the um, for, for the triangles? And then it was only a bit later that the mirror came. I remember looking at it and just one, one evening going, oh, if there were a mirror there, this would be this. Wow. And then when I put the mirror, the whole thing just became another whole, another, I mean, another whole space appeared. It became... Uh, it created another whole strength. Again, you will see that this is uh, in the magician's jewel, very prominently what we've already seen. Mirror of Space, Rainbow Symphony and Key of Life came next. Rainbow, uh, Mirror of Space came after I uh, moved to India and um, I was invited to make a, a documentary about on the River Ganges. And here we have an Om, a, a, U and M in Sanskrit, the three letters of Om. And for A, the A, we have uh, here the A in Sanskrit, the representing the form realm. And he, these are all photographs of snow and ice and um, pictures where water has been hardened. The, a, the U is a liquid, when water is in its state of uh, liquidity. And the M mm is when water is in the state of uh, gas, gas, so there are clouds. And uh, then here we have a rainbow. Um, uh, you can't actually see here, but these are rainbow colored clouds that sort of dissolve to, um, to emptiness. Sorry, as I move my arrow around, it keeps moving my, uh, my screen, my slides from one to the other. Now here we have, you'll see the, sorry here we go again the um an indication of the double triangle here and here we have the actual double triangle now this is a very very powerful shape as uh, many of you will know and rainbow symphony is pointing to the union of uh, light and sound um mirror of space is uh, you see in the two keys one lock we've got this uh, blue in the center here it represents the space of the five elements so you've got the space and the elements are coming out of the space and back into the space here again we've got the space and we've got all these uh, shapes are now one on one on top of the other rather than separated in this picture and in mirror of space what i do is i open the space of this uh, central part. So here we see the om, the sound om inside the space, which relates to the three most high levels of uh, of uh, of our, or rather, transformed into these three levels of uh, uh, wisdom and clarity and awareness. This is language of the Tibetan Vajrayana. We can uh, talk about that in 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 other words from other traditions, of course. And here the key of life. Now that's going to, um, again, play very, very prominently here in the Magician's Jewel. So all these five pieces of collage art, um, I am currently uh, putting into a new book, Universal Osmosis. Uh, why Universal Osmosis? It's the um, name of an exhibition that I have also did later on in London in 2016. Uh, of these five photocollage art pieces and universal osmosis meaning absorbed into everything everything absorbed into everything which is really um a, a succinct way of uh, of putting what i'm what i'm describing here now series two of my photocollage art pieces came after this exhibition in london 2017 to 2024 so some of you will have already seen the crystal of time um, which uh, I was invited by Dr. Karim to talk about this picture at his 2019 Special Topics Conference in uh, Victoria. And um, this really forms the axis of uh, the magician's jewel. Um, the center of the crystal of time 
is then magnified into the diamond lens doorway to infinity, which you see here, which is an infinite fractal toroidal field. Um, I've made a, a little map down here. If you imagine that this little map, you put it on 12 points where the clock, the numbers on the clock go, you'll come up, the result is basically this. <laughs> And there are more than 7,000 circles in this picture. This was my lockdown um, bit of fun, actually, cutting circles and sticking down, <laughs> sticking down these, uh, all these uh, 7,000 photos into this, uh, photos of circles into this, uh, into this picture using the five colors. And here, the tunnel vision, Eye of Eternity, which is hot off the press. I literally finished it last week. <clears throat> this is even not a high resolution photograph of it. Um, I haven't managed to get it up and um, take the a photograph with my, you know, a raw picture with my uh, proper camera yet, uh, because it's the weather has just been awful here. <laughs> I haven't been able to get it outside into a suitable place to do that. So these, again, these three pictures didn't come just like that, and they didn't come because I thought about them. They happened as I was uh, experiencing life. Um, I met Samuels Manigich at uh, a conference in South India in 2016, actually, where he watched my movie of the Circle of Immortality. And after watching that, he invited me to make a movie, as he put it, like that, about the Bosnian pyramids that uh, he had discovered back in 2005. He'd already had a lot of documentaries made, so he didn't want the standard, oh, what are you doing here? And why are you here? And what's the purpose of this? And what's that? He wanted me to make this uh, ephemeral, more ephemeral um, movie and to embed the meaning into it, uh, as I did with the Circle of Immortality. I embedded the meaning into that movie of uh, of the shape and its, uh, its different aspects, although I showed images of many different uh, places in, in Nepal. So you see, when you watch a kaleidoscopic film, you wouldn't know that I've embedded one of these shapes into it. It's not like weird or something. It's like, um, you know, a normal movie in the sense, I mean, it's not normal in the sense of uh, being a documentary where people are asking each other questions and you're finding out about the place. It's more talking about the the, the meaning behind the surface. Um, so it's, but it, it doesn't look like I've embedded the shapes into it. You wouldn't know that unless I told you, for example. Um, so I started going to Bosnia every year for the, the next three years. So 2017, 18 and 19, and started making the movie. And I met a lot of different people there who introduced me to different um different concepts of uh, of how to explain reality you know there I was sort of in a sense stuck in my Vajrayana language from Kathmandu and Sanskrit terms and this and that and now I'm going into a different language uh, a different uh, zone we're talking about the same thing but we're just talking about it from a, a different perspective it's like that mountain in, in the valley up in the Himalayas that I was taking the photographs of we're looking at the same thing but just from a different angle which was good because it really got me um, looking at, uh, um, uh, at, at, the, uh, at the nature of reality in a, in a different way. And especially from a sort of metaphysical, scientific view, more hermetic, uh, we're, we're moving towards Egypt here in this, uh, in this sense. So first came the crystal of time. And then came, I tried my best to embed the crystal of time into the Bosnian movie and nothing happened. It was just not working. Then came the diamond lens. And once the diamond lens came out, I could make the movie. So I made the movie back in 2020. Um, and then um, again, it's a very long story. I'm not gonna go into it now. We don't have the time. I started getting these callings to South America and um, this Chicana cross of the what we would uh, associate with the Andean tradition. Although I think you would or may have noticed that uh, there are three Chicana crosses which form the base of the Bodhanath Stupa in Kathmandu, which uh, I only noticed after <laughs> I lived there for six years, but I never noticed and never recognized this shape was there until I got deeply into analyzing the shape and making two trips to South America for it. So now literally hot off the press, um, it's uh, um, almost three and a half years in the making of this tunnel vision eye of eternity. Now, 
the Magician's Jewel emerged in 2020 to 2021. I had actually independently started working on a project to create an exhibition of Tibetan Book of the Dead, the Todor, in 2017. Um, so I'd done a lot of research. I traveled around and met people with, uh, you know, who were producing augmented reality um, things. I, I, you know, I hadn't got the magician's jewel yet. The magician's jewel did not emerge until 2021. So in 2017, I am thinking about an exhibition. I want it to include augmented reality. I'm talking to neuroscientists in London, and um, we are talking about creating this head um, the headgear to measure brain waves and to have this augmented reality effect in some kind of exhibition. We don't have an idea what the exhibition will be exactly yet, but some kind of exhibition that will include a way to express the bardo todo, the nature of existence, the process of existence, um, through going through some kind of uh, some kind of exhibition process. So let's look a little more at the bardo todo. In the actual text down here on the left, on the bottom right corner, you'll see I've put, there are six bardos that are um, talked about, but only we only get an explanation of three of the main bardos. I've already pointed those out because they form the center, central part of the magician's jewel. That black Fibonacci spiral being the bardo of death, the uh, dodecarycosahedron, the interior of that being the bardo of reality. And again, this white Fibonacci spiral coming out the other side being the bardo of becoming. So when we're coming back into life again. But these other three, which are mentioned here, the bardo of life, of sleep and meditation, are um, in a sense reflections of these uh, other um, these the, the three that are mentioned in the Bada Tudal. So the information and the instructions we receive in the Bada of Becoming are pertinent to our life. And the instructions that we get in the Bada of Death are pertinent to our sleep and how we can actually uh, awaken in sleep through lucid dreaming. Um, not that it puts it in that way. It doesn't talk about it in that language, but uh, there's an element of that. It, describes the process. And um, then the bardo of reality is the bardo of meditation. So what we would experience in a tantric uh, meditation um, is we would go through um, what uh, we could also see in the bardo of reality. But in the magician's jewel, here on the left here, I put a little picture of it. So we start off, you see, in this park in the Bardo of Life. This park is going to represent the Bardo of Life. Then we enter into the structure from one of these uh, entrance, entrances on one side here. Uh, I say entrances because, sorry, there are doorways, one doorway here, one on the other side. This is the entrance and that will be the exit. So you enter into the doorway here and you're going to the Bardo of Sleep, which as I mentioned before, is a little chamber underneath the mirror. So now you will go onto the structure and you will go beneath the mirror. You will experience the Bardo of, uh, of Sleep. After the Bardo of Sleep, you will come up and climb, go up the travelator, which will take you to the top to an Orm chamber, which is the Bardo of Meditation. After which you will come on a little uh, lift or something like that, which will bring you down to this part of the frame where you'll enter into the bardo of death, bardo of reality, bardo of becoming, and then another lift will take you down this side to the exit, where you'll go back into the park again. Now, you may have already guessed that these are also octaves of harmonic resonance. Each of these um, bardos are representing one octave. Of harmonic resonance and there are key numbers written here there are key numbers in here um you know when we talk about harmonics in the western sense we're talking about an octave that has seven notes plus one the last one which is the same as the first so the eighth note of the octave is the same as the first of that octave and also a pitch higher the first note of the next octave like this um, anyway, octaves of harmonic resonance are a huge, huge subject. But what I have done here is mentioned how octaves of harmonics are um, written into the Bardo Todol in the sense of numbers. Um, so here we have, I'll just go through one of these little uh, charts here. We have 
I've written here, eight layers ascending. So the Bardo of Becoming describes eight layers of how we take on physicality. We take on the, the five elements and the three, um, the three aspects of core aspects of mind. And then we have our eight, uh, uh, our octave of octave of life. And then we have our octave, eight layers descending of uh, of death. And then we have this gap in between. Interestingly, in the Bardo Toro, uh, it talks about eight for becoming and eight for, um, um, for dying. But there are 12 days in the Bardo of reality. And 12 is the uh, number of uh, semitones in an octave. So you see, when we talk about an octave, we can talk about it in whole tones or we can talk about it in semitones. And again, you see, this has another whole uh, um, whole meaning to it. So the Bada Tudal, the Tibetan Book of the Dead, is showing this passageway through existence detail by detail and giving us instructions of how to uh, uh, compose our mind when we are experiencing this process. But the allegory is, as I mentioned earlier, to show us how our consciousness is actually working moment by moment. Our moment by moment thought process in which a thought is being born, a thought is staying and a thought is dying. And then there's a little, little gap and then there's another thought being born, staying a while, dying. So the trick that the Bada Tudal tells us is to notice the process, A, and B, especially to notice when the thought is, when a thought is there, the minute we recognize that a thought is just a thought, it will die because it can't hold its power, power anymore. It will die and then we will have this little gap. And this little gap is a doorway through to the, again, in Vajrayana terms, the uh, primordial state, the natural prim primordial state, the, uh, um, the space where all potential resides, where... Um, you know, we are beyond materiality in that sense, although we can access it while we are in material, in a material body through this uh, conscious recognition of our mind process. So now, <clears throat> how did the magician's jewel appear? Sorry, this story will be over in a minute, but it's all part of the process. And I'll get into more uh, details about the uh, the installation after that. So um, while I was doing this, uh, um, looking at making a project and an exhibition on the Bardo Tudal, I met a lot of people and I was especially sort of going between um, the UK and the US to meet different companies and Europe, different countries in Europe, to meet uh, different companies who were producing things that would potentially help me with the project. And in this process, I got invited to participate in a very high profile exhibition at a very uh, great museum in London, the Victoria and Albert Museum. And uh, after creating a wonderful, uh, a very daring, I have to say, exhibition, especially for a, um, don't want to be rude about it, but they're kind of very classic, the v &A. This was like, uh, you know, uh, holographic shows and things and digital, uh, very, very deeply digital display, displayed um, installation pieces. They uh, accepted our, our proposal. And um, this was 2019, September. And we all know what happened a few months later in March of uh, 2020 when COVID hit. Um, so that was all right. Code was like, OK, well, we just have to ride this out. They said your um, exhibition probably won't take place till 2023, 2024 now because uh, things will get put back. Other exhibitions will also um, have to come first. Um, so, OK, that's fine. We can wait. We can wait. No problem. But then the um, there were two two curators um the curator who was employed by the vna himself and the other guy who i knew who had invited me onto the project um the one that was employed by the south uh, as a south asian uh, project uh, manager um of that department he suddenly died and with it our project died <laughs> because he was the kingpin of the project he was the one who had put the proposal they were trusting him to execute it anyhow so um the curator who was not employed by them but who i knew he said we are going to have to revamp the whole thing and 
um, he asked me to give him another proposal, two separate documents, one with a proposal for my photo collage art pictures and another of a Tibetan Book of the Dead project. Now, what happened when I was writing that report was an extraordinary process. I had two Word documents going and I was writing about my photo collage art and I was writing about the Tibetan Book of the Dead. And then one paragraph here just wanted to jump into that project and one paragraph here wanted to jump into the other project. And the projects, these two Word documents just at one point just merged into one. And then I was on a roller. I worked for the next uh, three weeks consecutively writing down a 50 page project report of the Magician's Jewel bit by bit, piece by piece. I mean, from a visionary angle and um, not really even knowing if the science would uh, play up to this installation. I just wrote it down. Whatever comes, comes. So now I have a working draft of The Magician's Jewel. And at the same time, I went to a fellow who lives in a Italian fellow who lives in a village just a couple of uh, couple away from us up here in the in the Himalayan Valley where I live, um, who's a graphic designer and he does all my graphic design work. He did this uh, this computer um, image, these computer images for me. And we sat together and we drew out this uh, magician's jewel according to the working draft over the next um, next couple of weeks. I worked with him day by day to do this. So here we have an immersive, interactive installation piece for an exhibition. <laughs> Here is the piece that I was uh, looking for all those years that I was out hunting in the UK and US and Europe and all of that. And it has the symbolic shapes that are corresponding to universal truths, the pl platonic solids, uh, multi levels of perspective, and plus this uh, reflective quality of the mirror, which of course adds just a whole nother dimension to it. These four sections I've already mentioned, the outer inner secret and heart essence, which I describe in detail in my project report in my working draft. And um, a way that participants can follow this specific path around the installation so that they will experience this lively and immersive rendition of the Bada Todo. But not just making it a pretty installation piece, making it useful to the whole environment that this uh, whole installation should also be designed. You know, that's, by this point, I'm also studying biogeometry and other sort of scientific fields in that sense. Um, and I wanted to be useful so that it would clear up, uh, you know, a large enough structure could clear up a large enough area around it of the electro smog or create a standing columnar wave, uh, could become part of the, um, um, the grid, uh, around it, you know, to, to impress energy into the, in, into the ley lines and the, uh, and the electromagnetic grids around it and re reionize the atmosphere. So, you know, in a sense, if it went up in, say, central London, it would have a good radius of some miles around it. And can you imagine clearing up a city of that kind of dimension and volume of uh, of people and uh, and uh, electro smog, which of course is there in every place on Earth now? Um, why the name the magician's jewel? Well, it's not like I scratch my head and what shall I call it? What shall I call it? It was apparent right from the offset when I started um, writing the project report that uh, its name was, was The Magician's Jewel. And um, of course, you might have seen that there's this uh, correlation to the Philosopher's Stone here. And I think that's uh, probably where it came from in that sense. And the Philosopher's Stone being this transformation um, item, this item or this, this aspect that can transform base metal into gold. Here we've also got this allegory of the alchemy of our own mind transformation going on here. And the magician's jewel with the, uh, when you participate in the magician's jewel and you go through this uh, process, it is a process of mind transformation. Um, <clears throat> again, I've already mentioned that we've got this uh, aspect of uh, transforming Hertzian to longitudinal waves. Um, which uh, changes the whole nature of, uh, of, of the subtle energy realm that uh, you as a biological creature are existing in, and therefore you would resonate with that higher level 
in biogeometry terms, BG3 aspect, which would, uh, uh, that interaction gives you um, so much potential and possibility to uh, go towards health and and to center your, and balance your system and to give you life force, to improve your life force. Of course, you've already got life force, but to improve your life force. And then also to, uh, you know, traverse this inner vortex path that goes to its own center and, and you know, transform itself. So it's, you know, um, in, in the center, um, we're talking about this implosion uh, going on in the center, which is part of the heart essence <laughs> of this, uh, the heart essence meaning of this installation. So here we've got the out outer structure of uh, the magician's jewel. Um, here's a large picture of it. And here it's broken down into its elements. We've got the circle of immortality and the pure vision transformed into organized confusion. You can see them here, and I've already described how they fit in. So you see in the pure vision transformed into organized confusion. Here, this central part is now going to be where the, cent where the, the circular mirror sits. And in a sense, all those shapes that you see in the, in, the, in the central part of it have now become sort of their 3D. They've kind of risen up and inside this, uh, in, inside this vortex. Here you can see the, um, it forms also the park area and this outer rim of this central part with the, these are flower beds and these are the stones, the rocks on the side of the pools. And um, now in the pure vision um, transformed into organized confusion, all the five elements are now on top of each other. Um, uh, we've, as I've mentioned before, we've got this introduction to the octaves of harmonic resonance. Here you'll see there are actually three octaves, one, two, three and again repeated one two three and again six on the other side so six and six twelve twelve again being the prominent number um we've got the 16 bliss worlds i mentioned before the scale of bliss from total depression to enlightenment perfect uh, bliss the hundred peaceful and wrathful deities i actually already in this second picture i embedded the hundred peaceful and wrathful deities which are described in in, in a lot of detail in the Bada Tudor, in the Bada of Reality section of the Bada Tudor. They are really the control room of existence. This is where we are coming to the uh, purification of the senses, the purification of mind, the purification of the elements. And then um, it, here in the Pure Vision, I have actually used exactly 100 photographs. And in this central part here, are the peaceful deities and in these two side wings plus the exterior part which is correlating to the octaves of harmonic resonance these are the wrathful deities more of that in a minute um yes this circular mirror sits inside this white circle so this would be here on the uh on the installation and um it's the uh yeah this is the this bar this park area is the representing the bardo of life and is the starting point of the journey through the magician's jewel for participants um i'm going i wrote this down because this is important i wanted to um really highlight this and so i'm just going to read it i'm going to have to move this um my own picture is actually uh, covering part of the text. An exact number of photos are laid out around the edges of pure vision transformed into organized confusion to symbolically relate to the 22 whole notes of harmonic resonance found in three musical octaves of seven whole notes each. Seven times three equals 21 plus one, which is the last note of the third octave and first note of the fourth equaling 22. Here we can see these same numbers of photos appearing as stepping stones upon the four outer pools and flower beds around the central structure, sinuously weaving around on each side of the whole installation, creating a subtle display of 22 over seven, which is pi, a mystical union of sound and light that pertains to a natural harmonic structure that we find throughout all dimensional layers of existence. This musical symmetry of pi expresses the correct resonance of this most this innermost harmony that has been employed by people since recorded history began within genres and mythology, architecture, administrative procedures, as well as the written word, due to its capacity to bioenergetically enhance and bring physical well-being and balance to the collective. 
At our innermost biological level, this same ratio of 22 over 7 directly relates to the structure of our human DNA, of which the nucleus of each cell normally contains 22 functioning chromosomes out of its 23. So there are 20 to make the amino acids required to form proteins and one start and one stop function. And the seven notes in an octave of harmonic resonance before the first note is repeated at its higher level as the last note of the current and the first of the next octave. So this 22 over 7 is embedded into this park as you immediately arrive at the um, at the magician's dual structure at the park level, you will find this uh, um, this pie aspect. Here we have the circle of immortality. So these spirals turn upon a four-sided open pyramid. Um, there's this outer vortex, which is representing the path leading into and out of existence. So there's a two-way process going on here. One goes in and one comes, one goes out. And then we've got the mirror. So all these aspects are replicated in the magician's jewel. Now, later, um, the picture that I just made, the tunnel vision eye of eternity, we will find that if we were to stand inside the vortex and look up, we would see patterned upon it the tunnel vision eye of eternity. And when we come to the photograph of that in a minute, I'll explain further what I mean about that. <laughs> so here is the inner structure of the magician's jewel. These are next three pictures of series um, one photo collage art pictures. So we have the eight crystals of uh, crystal of time plus the diamond lens doorway to infinity make up this inner part of the magician's jewel. So here we see we've got the double uh, triangle, the um, uh, which is pertaining to the rainbow symphony. We've got the orm chamber, which is pertaining to the um, the mirror of space. And we've got this structure, which is an upside down version of the key of life. Again, I'm going to um, talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Here we can see a tricolor uh, structural frame and it's equal and opposite reflection in the mirror that comprises one dark blue four-sided based open pyramid. So again, we've seen this in the circle of immortality installation that I made earlier that contains the whole of the interior part of the structure. Now, this is really important. This is the container of this inner mechanism. So they are not separate in any way. These are, uh, they have to be in union with each other. There has to be a connection between each part of the <clears throat> inner structure mechanism and this container. It's not just a, a structure to hold it in place. It's alive. It's as alive as the mechanism that is uh, seen coming along the axis here. Double tetrahedron, one pointing downwards, which is red, and one pointing upwards, which is right, white, which we see here pointing up, and this red one pointing down and an axis that is divided into an upper and lower part of four crystals each, totaling eight, that sit either side of a three-dimensional dodecaricosahedron shape. And this has 12 pentagonal crystal faces, each containing five colors. Again, the five, the five colors. Five is, is seen everywhere here. Now, um, this I came to call the Divine Vajra, and I'm, I have actually given, made it an installation piece of its own because it, it is the heart essence. Uh, it contains the heart essence mechanism of the whole structure. If this installation is really going to work as um, something that's cleaning up the environment, the electrosmog, then this is the mechanism that does it. And uh, very nicely, um, we can also see that at its base here, this last crystal crystal of it, this lowest crystal of it, is poking into the two keys, one lock, which are a mechanism at the base of its structure that will move. The humans are coming onto the participants, rather, who are mostly going to be humans, I would imagine, are coming onto the structure, and they are going to move in certain 
um, in, in certain ways to get this uh, two keys, one lock, this uh, cross at the bottom, to get it moving. And in moving that uh, this two keys, one lock, it strikes the crystal, which creates piezoelectricity, which will carry through the four crystals up to this uh, central uh, dodecaricosahedron in which this process of uh, implosion we see here on the right through the pentagonal, one of the pentagonal faces, which is at the bottom of the dodecaricosahedron, will capture this energy and take it down a vortex at a certain angle to center in which theoretically it should turn in to transform this Hertzian uh, sinusoidal wave into this pulsation of a longitudinal wave and create the this uh, energy that uh, can clear up the emanate this energy that can clear up the radiation and electro smog in the environment and at the top of the divine vajra um, where the orm chamber is uh, we can also see how that is connected to the topmost crystal. And in the chanting, the octa the, the um, tones, the octave of, of tones that will be sounding inside this orm chamber, this sound will also strike the crystal and create piezoelectricity. Um, and again, this will be carried down to the center. We see it coming down here, captured again into this pentagonal shape. 10, uh, 10 waves going down to, to source for this, uh, this two wave coming to source and um, able to emit this, uh, this cause this transfer, transformation of Hertzian wave, Hertzian trans, transverse wave into, into longitudinal. So we've got something happening at the top of the divine vajra and something happening at the bottom of the divine vajra that are striking the crystal through piezoelectricity, bringing the energy to center and then to this implosion. Rainbow symphony. So here we have a part of the structure, the double tetrahedron now, um, and, and the cube here as well, um, which is in the other picture, which you've already seen. Um, not here, we'll come up across it in a minute. And of course, we know that whenever you have a um, six or a double triangle, this is not six sided. This is actually a, a tetrahedron pointing down, a tetrahedron pointing up. There are eight points here, not six. But whenever we have this structure, we have a cube here on the right. Here's Metatron, Met Metatron's cube. And in that, in that, inside that, we have all the platonic solids uh, inherently inside that uh, that cube shape. Um, the spirals of the, I put here COI, the circle of immortality are found here, inside here, the golden spirals going round. Starting here, it goes this way. And starting here, it goes the other way. And then we have an octahedron at the center. It's a little bit difficult to understand. Here is a four-sided pyramid pointing up and a four-sided pyramid pointing down. It will take you a moment to actually be able to spot where that octahedron is. Um, and the center here, right in the center is defining 10 points, one in the center, three around it, the five elements we see in the in the um, same as the two keys, one lock order. And you can't actually see it here because it's the, it, it's not so exposed. There's a, um, a, a ring which it explains like that's the final um, manifestation of uh, of uh, all these, all these points are coming from source to manifestation in ten points, and again, that's going to be um, magnified and detailed in my next picture, the key of life. And here we have uh, sixty-four. Oops, sorry. Here we have sixty-four triangles around the edge. We also saw these sixty-four uh, also here. We're starting to talk about eight and 64, very important numbers. We've already seen that eight is the number of uh, steps to come into existence. Eight stay, eight coming out in the border of dying. Um, we can, uh, we you know, it's squared to 64. Anyhow, this is a whole nother discussion. It's a huge, uh, huge, huge topic. 
Um, next is the key of life. Now, this is actually holding, again, we see pi here. This is holding 22 sides here, 22 lines, as in parts of this container. This is the container. If you see here, here is the square. It's a hyper square in the sense it doesn't look like a two dimensional square. But if you imagine the um, this turned upside down, this is actually how it is the right way up. Now turn it upside down. You'll have this structure, this uh, frame of the uh, this whole octahedron of the um, of the magician's jewel. This is the frame. And it's holding many different shapes within it, as you can see, hyper shapes within it. And you've Oh, sorry, this keeps going from one to the other when I move my mouse. And um, you'll see here also the uh, octave of, uh, of sound. So from this point, we've got an octave of sound resounding and we've got 10 points. You'll see the 10 points are actually elucidated here by these one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and then two at the center, nine, ten which are showing the process of manifestation from source to full manifestation. So we've got, 20, we, again, we've got pi here. We've got the 22 uh, sides of these shapes and the seven, uh, seven sounds. And so this forms, again, a union of sound and light, which results in this correctly shaped precious form that perfectly bends the light to refract multidimensional appearance. Now, that's a very important phrase because the clear light that exists all around us, which doesn't have any material form in it, needs to be refracted in order to come into, uh, into existence. Here there are 22 sides to the inner structural part of the magician's jewel. So with the dark blue octahedron, eight sides, red tetrahedron, six sides, white tetrahedron, six sides, the two ends of the axis containing four crystals, each two sides equaling 22 sides. And one octave of the seven notes of Orm are resounding in the chamber. The eighth is discounted here because it's inherently the same tone as the first one, just at a different pitch. So here we have the 22 sides of form equals light. The seven unique tones equals sound in the octave, causing the mathematical value of pi again to occur, 22 over seven, revealing here on the right, which is a top-down view of the magician's jewel if you Look at it from the top, how the shapes are formed, the inner gem. This is the jewel, the inner jewel, the a kind of secret aspect of the magician's jewel. We look at it from the top down and we see this uh, beautiful image of uh, something that would look like should be inside the middle of your ring, you know, <laughs> maybe with sapphire and blue sapphire and diamond and ruby and what else. So I'm sorry about this uh, uh, map on the left. This is the map of the 10 points of the key of life, which I've already just mentioned to you of how the you know, process of manifestation and dissolution of existence. Again, I've put it here in Vajrayana terms. I'm sorry that it's uh, come out in this dark color, but it was uh, you know black lines on a white piece of paper. And when I use this uh, particular format for this PowerPoint presentation, it, it came up a little dark. But here we have that point from which all of this manifestation is occurring, is coming out of. Plus, that's the point that the octave of, of, of sound is coming out of as well. We have this uh, point of awareness, this first um, aspect, and which um, also contains inherently its wisdom here and its compassion here, um, which also... Uh, has the capacity to know itself, which is its perceptive quality of awareness, is here along the same axis as you see here of awareness itself and its perceptive quality that has the capacity. Now we're entering into the relative world. And as soon as the perceptive quality of awareness arises, with it arises the whole of space. And then within that space, there is uh, the potential is inherent in the space. And uh, so there's uh, this uh, movement when once this movement of mind occurs, there's wind, air is the first element to come out of the space. And with this movement comes friction, so fire. And the fire melts this inherent potential, which is the earth inside the space. And then the nectar 
uh, which is the water, the nectar of life force occurs. You see, these are the central elements that we see at the heart of the uh, mandala of the hundred peaceful and wrathful deities. These are the heart essence of uh, how our um, appearance, how what we see is uh, coming into appearance. Um, so in this way, the whole inner structure of the magician's jewel is an upside down multidimensional representation of the key of life, my photocollage art piece, that is based on the meaning of the purba. Here we see this purba. This is a Tibetan ritual, um, uh, Tibetan master's uh, ritual uh, dagger that it looks like it could be used for nefarious things, but it's not. It's uh, like a conductor's baton of the peaceful and wrathful deity mandala is used to tame the subtle energy patterns before they come into physical manifestation. So you'll see the when the Tibetan master moves this uh, this uh, purba, it's a very beautiful movement. It's very gentle. It's not like da 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 da. It's really very gentle movement of this uh, of this uh, ritual object. But you see the the key of life. All the photographs in the key of life are also. Um, pertaining to uh, sacred places and uh, uh, people who are also um, um, practicing sacred uh, sacred uh, traditions. But you'll see that this, uh, even the shape of this key of life is taking on the shape of this, uh, this purba, the end part of this purba here, which is also, um, you know, similar to what we see in the magician's jewel. So that uh, life force may pervade the structure, meaning the magician's jewel, a union of the light and sound of this emanation of 22 pathways and seven unique tones forms a framework within which the 10 main points of the step-by-step -step manifestation and dissolution of consciousness of its compression and expansion may occur. So thus displaying a step-by-step -step flow of the arising of the illusion of appearance from its essential clear light state into full manifestation, here we have 32 aspects of pure energy. And put together in this way, the magician's jewel both holds key information about the nature of existence, as well as holding the correct components through which the bending and refracting of light and sound interacting with consciousness. We need these three components. The light is the... Um, the light is the compassion, the sound is the wisdom, and the consciousness is the awareness. These are the three essential components that we've been talking about. Out of our eight, these are the three aspects of mind. The five being the elements, the three being these uh, key aspects, light, sound, and this interaction of light, sound, and consciousness. So this may occur. So here I come back to this 1864 story. We see in these three pictures that this uh, we've actually got on all these sides that here is eight photograph. Well, it's a photograph cut into eight strips, eight times. So eight, eight is a 64. Here we've got the 64 around the edge. Here we've got again the 64 around the edge in Rainbow Symphony. So demonstrating this uh, um, balancing, a balancing phenomena that occurs throughout existence, these 22 these sides, 22 sides, plus the 10 aspects of process of manifestation equals 32. They all have an equal and opposite value reflected inside the mirror, making 64, which is, of course, the square of eight, the next exponential expansion of eight points, after which comes 512, 4096, et cetera, et cetera, creating like in one millisecond of a process that just goes wham through this a uh, matrix of exponential expansion creates the total matrix of space to infinity that may hold any appearance at all. I mean, it's kind of phenomenal. The one, of course, is the point in the center of, of all of these. Um, so this key of life, rainbow symphony, a mirror of space, all display the 64 shapes surrounding their exterior so you see how 64 has come from 32, which has come from 22 plus 10. Yeah, we've got pi on the other side, which is 22 over 7, the union of the sound and the light. And then we've got this process of manifestation happening through this uh, process of 8, 8 and becoming 64, et cetera, et cetera. So here I'm repeating again um, the um, topics that I've covered in the Magician's Jewel. Um, I don't think I need to read them again. I think they're quite, uh, um, quite obvious. And I know that we should be watching the time. 
the how am I okay for another few minutes, uh, Judy? Yeah. Okay. So um, the next thing that happened was because now all of this we've got to work it. I've got a working draft, so I've written it down in words. I've got computer graphic designs. But you know, that's not enough. You need some kind of tangibility in order to understand and to really kind of try to figure out the angles and how it would look and how that goes in relation to this and what sort of size this might be, et cetera, et cetera. My husband and I actually made a model of it. Um, he's very, very good at these things. So I asked him, you know, please, can you do this and this? And he would cut and using these household materials, cardboard and matchsticks. Here you see the dodecaride cosahedron here in the center has been made of matchsticks and little pieces of uh, card put together to make the triangles. This is all kind of pieces of mm, frame wood. And this is like a little pipe. This is one of the Fibonacci spirals, which he painted one black and one white. So here you see, this is how the structure will actually look, but then we magnify it into, into large, hopefully, uh, answering your question earlier, Judy, to 100 feet or so, if an exhibition space would allow it, because the participants need to have space to, in, to, to really, you know, walk around and see the bigger, the larger, the more awe-inspiring, the more it gives you that, you know, feeling it more and more, it really emphasizes this uh, process of existence. We're talking about the process of existence here, you know, I mean, this is a, a big subject. <laughs> we, we don't want it to be, a, I mean, obviously when it's a, when it's going to be a prototype, it's going to be a little thing just to figure out how, how it works. But as an, as an installation, it needs to be large, huge. It needs to be as big as possible. So that, you know, the space in the chambers, there's a, you know, that you have to walk through these passageways. Um, so here's the model, which was kind of fun. This model is uh, five feet to give it some, uh, um, to give it a tangibility. Now here we come off to the, come to the hot off the press story of the Tunnel Vision Eye of Eternity, which took me about three and a half years to make. Um, I'd already made the movie on Bosnia. Why did I need another picture? Well, because the story was not complete. Here we see again on the right, I show the crystal of time, the diamond lens, doorway to infinity. Both of these pictures are now embedded into both the magician's jewel as well as the movie that I've made on the um, Bosnian pyramids. But what I didn't realize is at the time and what I've already mentioned in, uh, you know, during this presentation is that this um, crystal of time, which has become the divine Vajra, which is the axis, in itself is only half, or only a part of the equation. It needs to, it seems that it needs to correlate to its container. This now just place your eye on the central blue dot here and see this long vortex tunnel appear. And the divine Vajra will fit, the top point of the divine Vajra will fit into this blue dot at the center of this uh, tunnel vision eye of eternity. And it will interact with these aspects that I've written here. These are pathways to the center. How did I make this? It's simple. There were two Fibonacci spirals coming from eight points on the Chicana, on the edge of the Chicana. So I would lay down the template and make the spiral to center, each nine turns to center, each of these points, nine turns to center, one clockwise and one anti-clockwise until I had a pattern on the white uh, sheet, the white cloth, which is uh, on, at the base of it. And then inside that pattern, I saw these steps leading to the center and I created 100, here's that word again, 100 steps leading us across the space. Because how do we cross a vortex? A vortex is multidimensional. It's taking us through different layers. I mean, it's like, oh yes, crossing the vortex, how simple. You know, we need a way, we need a method, we need a pathway to get across there. So I again correlated and used this 100 peaceful wrathful deities, these 100 steps. I'll show you how I made them. See, here you have 
one, two, three, four, and then the root of it, five. One, two, three, four, five. There are five of these roots. Again, the number five. And you see how they cross this space and bring you to the central part of this uh, of this vortex. This is, again, it looks very much like a mandala that you would find uh, in, especially in Eastern uh, Eastern art, you'd find a something coming towards the center, like often four. You know, four is a natural, uh, you know, cross is a natural shape, as I've mentioned before. So how did this, uh, how did this start? This picture started with me, this shape, this chakana came into my mind like boom, you know, uh, popped out of the right brain into my left brain and said hello here I am and I'm like what are you who are you and they say well walk my path and you will find me so three and a half years I've walked the path of the Chicana <clears throat> it's taken me twice to South America to Bolivia and Peru for which I was having these intuitive callings come 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 you know and actually all the photographs in this uh, in this picture are of Chicanas that I took in Peru and Bolivia um so yeah i um say i say here <clears throat> imagine standing inside the magician's jewel and looking up into the cone of its frame as well as down into its mirror so you imagine you look up you can see this vortex pathway with its steps leading to center <clears throat> here we've got the four pillars of the frame of the magician's jewel and looking down into the mirror you will also see this vortex Again, this, you know, it took me a long time to understand when I made the circle of immortality. In fact, I should go back to a picture of the circle of immortality because this is an important point. Um, it's a few pictures back now. I was thinking from, you know, right from the offset when, you know, I made this piece, I was thinking that the part of it was, which was actually tangible, the material part of it, the material spiral here, leading to source this was our material world and what was inside the mirror was the corresponding consciousness i knew that one was consciousness and one was you know the consciousness that is creating its appearance so likewise we've got this in the magician's jewel remember the state of your mind will determine the images that come out of your augmented reality program what you'll see through those glasses. So likewise, the consciousness that we put into the material world or the space around us, let's say, is going to determine how that appearance arises. You know, good thoughts, nice things, bad thoughts, bad things, etc. I mean, but then after some time, it took me a long time to realize that actually what we see here above the mirror, this material form of the circle of immortality, this spiral here, is actually our consciousness appearing within the mirror of space that is around us. What is determining, what is more solid in this sense is our consciousness. What our consciousness is putting out there is what appears. So it took me a while to figure that out, but I think you'll get it. Let's go back to where we were before. Um, yeah, here we go. I've put this, uh, the 100 Peaceful and Wrathful Deities, because you've seen them again and again. They are in so many ways. I've come to look at them as like the control room of existence. Of course, here you see deities. It looks all Eastern. It looks all Buddhist. It looks all whatever. But if you go beyond the trappings of how they look and look at the symbol, really deeply look at the symbol, you will find the same thing repeated throughout all traditions. Here we've got our central union of duality and non-duality, our union of absolute and relative existence, you know, the source and the manifest world. Here they are in the, the divine couple that uh, uh, emerge as five aspects, as the five elements, as the five... Uh, um, uh, as the five wisdoms, as you know, in all these different symbolic uh, symbolic ways, but predominantly, I mean, it's a very very long passage in the Bhagavad in the Tibetan Book of the Dead that describes each and every one of these deities, what they're holding in their hands, how they look, their colors, the type of hairstyle they've got. Everything is described in detail, but it's all symbol. 
And when you look beyond the symbol, you find the meaning. So what we see here is um, pertaining to this purification of the different faculties of human operation, the senses, the elements, and the mind. We purify our senses. What have we got left? I mean, just think about that a moment. No more sight, nothing to see. No more smell, nothing to smell. No more taste, nothing to taste. No more hearing, nothing to hear. No more touch nothing to feel what is left the elements are purified purified back to what back to their essential state of being the mind is purified the mind is purified even of its own uh aspects and qualities what is left what is left we have this two in the middle and the two itself they dissolve into one which dissolves into you know its own uh, um the, the, what in the Vajrayana they term as the clear light aspect but there are a lot of different names for that of course across different traditions here we have the peaceful there are 48 peaceful and there are uh, um, 40 sorry 42 peaceful and 58 wrathful making 100 and we've seen this pathway of the uh, implosion to source starting from five going down 10 layers going both clockwise and anti-clockwise, we have 100 node points on our implosion cone. And each of these 100 points on the implosion cone are actually node points that in the Tibetan Book of the Dead, in the Bardo Todo, Bardo of Reality, it talks about each of these deities as being a possibility to escape the returning into what they call samsaric existence, samsara being this wheel of existence that just goes on and on and on until you manage to boot yourself out and to get some control over what's actually happening. You know, otherwise you're blown like a feather in the wind around and around and around on this wheel. So each of these node points on this wave of this implosion wave that we see in the heart of the magician's jewel coming to source is a point upon which uh, it, pertains to one, uh, each of these points pertains to um, an aspect of the dissolution and purification of our um, material uh, mind and body and our existence within this uh, samsaric realm. They're archetypes, basically. I mean, when we um, look at archetypes across the, across the board, you know, the peaceful deities could be the angels and the... Um, uh, wrathful deities could be the demons, but we're not talking about it in terms of good and bad here. These are qualities. The peaceful qualities are like in the body of reality, for example, they'll be like these deity, huge, massive size of a mountain comes in front of you and says, remember who you are, my dear, my sweet dear, remember who you are in a peaceful kind of way. Whereas the wrathful ones, it's got to the point you're about to fall back into the bardo of becoming. You're about to fall back into samsaric realm again. You, again, you've lost the plot. You haven't caught hold of the uh, of the point. You haven't seen that your um, your clear light existence, your the your inherent essence, is all about you. Again, they term that like a a child jumping into its mother's arms. It leaps into this. Uh, um, this this space of reality and uh, becomes enlightened. And again, this is the uh, Eastern term to call it enlightenment, um, which really means that it understands its uh, its nature enough to be able to jump into that space and be absorbed by it. Again, we have the universal osmosis here, this being absorbed, everything being absorbed into itself. So when you failed to see that, and the peaceful deities have been like, oh, come, 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 come. And remember, remember, remember your existence. After that, the wrathful deities come and now they're more wrathful. Wrathful, wrath is not anger. It's it's compassion. It's compassionate. But it's like, remember who you are. Come on. You know, like screaming at you. Don't forget, don't forget. You're about to fall into the samsaric realms again. But don't remember who you are. Come on, just jump into my heart and you will be, you know, in a you know taken to the taken to the pure realms kind of thing so now i come to the point 
Um, I've explained quite a lot about the magician's jewel. In fact, more than I was planning to today. I was planning only to do outer and, in, outer and inner, but I have touched on some uh, secret and heart essence aspects of it, of it as well today. The next uh, step of this journey, having made the written the working draft and having uh, made a model of it and having thought about it through the photo collage art pictures, which are giving me a lot of information, each of the symbols and different parts of the photo collage art are giving me a lot of information about what it means and what how it should be. Um, I do want to make a small prototype of it. This means sort of working with various crystals, which kind of crystals would come together? How does that create the, you see the divine Vajra here has three toroidal fields around it. How does that affect the toroidal fields? How do they operate? How do we get this piezoelectric thing to work and the implosion to happen and the, which metals do we use? And blah, 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 blah. so many questions, so many things. So um, it is planned that uh, if I make it to the US this year, which I really hope I do, um, I was going to pin it on the back of one of the biogeometry functions, which may happen later this year. If not, uh, maybe I'll come anyway for it. I'd like to hold a workshop and invite whoever may be interested to come along and to really have a, a just a discussion, a, a, a brainstorm as to how we could put this together and to think about how to make the prototype of it because before this thing goes up for real, it's got to be a working mechanism and we need to know um, how to make it, which requires experts of many different fields of which I am not. I may have the visionary capacity, but uh, when it comes to this, uh, you know, how to put this together, I need a lot of help. So uh, um, I'll be inviting those who are interested to participate in that. Again, as I've mentioned here, the dates are yet to be defined depending on my trip to the US. A very last thing I'm going to leave you with is, um, and again, I'm not gonna go through all these points because I've mentioned most of them throughout the talk, is how the, um, how the magician's jewel could function using some aspect of human life force and consciousness. Now we've seen life force in the sense there'll be sound in the upper chamber and there'll be movement in the lower chamber the lower, by the mirror. So movement is, is an aspect of using humans and sound is an aspect of using humans. But I'm really talking about um, this aspect of consciousness. And right from the offset of uh, um, receiving this vision of the magician's jewel, I always thought that it's going to some in some way be possible for humans to interact with this machine and make it work in some way don't know how that happens but um that came to me as a a possibility here already of course we've got the human interaction with the augmented reality and the virtual reality so that is there but i'm meaning beyond that i'm meaning actually with the human consciousness how that may have an impact on its functioning um, yes, that will be very interesting to see. So here we are. This is just one of the computer graphic pictures I made of a top-down view of the inside the icosahedron, dodecahedron icosahedron in the centre, and the implosion going in and from underneath coming out. Again, you see these how these spirals come together, which you will have seen this kind of shape as those four steps on the pathways of the of the tunnel vision eye of eternity my latest picture so which is how i actually identified these uh, this pathway and made that uh, four directional um pathway across the space into the center of the tunnel vision eye of eternity so there's my website uh, pyramidkey.com um on which you know i keep putting up more information about the pictures and about the magician's jewel as it comes to me it's quite active I'm in the process of really figuring things out and going deeper and deeper into it now and um yeah there we are I think I'm going to leave you with that for now and if you have any questions or um, any comments or any insights I would love to hear and um the floor is open to you. Thank you. Thank and you. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Susan. I mean, this is just an incredible amount of information. 
I know. That sorry. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I'm. It's in a good way, right? Um, so much so, actually, Elizabeth um, commented. It's almost as if this is the creation of a living, self-maintaining quantum universe. And I was kind of getting this sense that this is you're creating something living here. I mean, I I don't want to get like. I know my our people are okay with the woo-woo stuff, but it's feeling like it's it is it is asking you to call it into existence. Is that a that's is, what that's what I mean about this? I've always had this idea that it must somehow have this uh, interaction with human consciousness. Yeah, and you know, even Dr. Karim has been talking about that recently in his uh, uh, the one of his the first hidden reality video uh, book review that he did recently, and that's where I decided that I was actually going to say this today, um, because he said it. He said there was a time when you know we had this perfect interaction between left and right brain, and humans did power machines, and I was like, thank you. I knew it was true. I know that it it's possible somehow. I don't know how, but so what you're saying, yeah, resonates. Thank you. I, I was wondering if Dr. Kareem has seen this. Has just has he seen your your plans? In 2021, when I first um, it first came hot off the press, I did send him the video. And his only comment was, turn it clockwise. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you've got this, this exhibition going like this, you know, the, the, the piece by piece uh, video of it uh, turning around clockwise. Nice. But you know, I haven't actually been in touch with him since. In fact, he's been awfully difficult to get in touch with while he's been writing his book. He's just I, been like, he shut, yeah. just been kind of sh uh, shut everybody up for the time so being. Jackie wants to know, she says, why not install it on the earth outside like a modern infinite, infinite circle of stones strategically placed? Absolutely, absolutely, and absolutely. Exactly what I was talking about when I mentioned the uh, standing columnar wave being mm -hmm. created by the union of the divine Vajra with its container, which is the, the, the frame, that creates the standing columnar wave, which equally has this 90 degree solitron wave, which does and should connect into the natural earth grids. You see, if it connects into the, the grid, which has the pyramids and the medicine wheels and the obelisks and the, I mean, this has been, been going on for, 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 for donkey's years. We've been doing this for millennia. Uh, more than millennia, you know, we have been capturing the energy of the earth and, um, you know, in this grid and using it to magnify and augment a the grid to increase the power of the grid. And secondly, to have these points where on earth where we can get this beaming out of of this uh, resonant uh, energy. Is, is this... <laughs> I'm, I'm, this is a really ignorant question and I apologize for it, but I'm just wondering, is this like stupa 2.0? Like, is this, is this the function that the stupas have, have um, performed for the, for the years and years that people have been making them? You mentioned that giant one. Yeah. Um, this just got feels it. like, you know, stupa of the 21st century. So let me tell you an example of Tibet. So, as, as per the Tibetans, the shape of Tibet in the old days, now Tibet is not Tibet, it's part of China, as you all know, but Tibet of the olden days had the shape of a demoness. Mm. And in order to control this demoness, which was the whole huge, I mean, Tibet was a huge country crossing all this plateau of, uh, you know, Gobi Desert and, and, and the Himalayas and, and, you know, the plateau, really high, high plateau, huge, huge, huge. And this demoness would uh, cause trouble here and there on her body. So the map of the of Tibet is the demoness and she would control. So what we know, of course, is they're describing areas of the earth which are potentially um, bad, as in, you know, where there are fault zones, earthquakes, da, 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 like this. So in order to uh, suppress and to calm this demoness that was the shape of Tibet, they would puncture the earth with these stupas. And these stupas not only control, uh, you know, are made of shapes, these precious shapes and like numbers, the numbers, the shapes, there are exact designs that you have to copy that they've been doing for, again, they've carried throughout the, 
the years, the millennia, the shapes and the exact design of the stupa in order to quell this uh, so-called bad energy. Um, but also these stupas contain many, many precious relics and precious gems and jewels and, and uh, mantras and um, all these precious things you can imagine are inside these stupas and they puncture the earth and they quell the, 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 the demoness. So just to give you an idea, yes, is what I'm saying to what you're saying, absolutely. Um. Fantastic. And so Jackie was talking about putting it on, on, you know, outside in the earth. He's, and she said, then it would be a stargate energizing the ley lines inside and outside of us in the earth. Do, is that, you know, I, I'm, I, I love it that she said that because I'm very hesitant to like you mentioned, woo -woo, but I don't want people being too like, Oh my <laughs> God, she's off, off her trolley, you know? Right, the kind of, kind of thing. But who on earth really knows what we are actually making here? I mean, yes, the this uh, implosion to source is a huge. I mean, I'm talking about it casually, like, oh yes, we just take the energy down the crystals, bring it up, and create this implosion to source. I mean, what actually happens when that happens? This is why we have to create the prototype. This is why we have to explore how, where, what, and like you said, putting it on the natural earth grids, grids exactly which will emphasize and augment the energy which is already coming just from this installation the only impracticality of having it say outside is that you know there are a lot of parts to this and rain and snow and and wind and all the rest of it will just eat away at it so somehow we need to find a place and i've been looking for this place for years now where it will a perform this function it's sitting on a key point of the grid and it will be protected from the elements so this is the you know there are some considerations here right there are many and we because so we had talked last time we spoke we you talked about um you know the the energies contained in the crystals and you can th this could get dangerous right if you don't know what you're doing there's there's a lot of energy that you're that that you will be um um encountering so this is you know the call for expertise um great great expertise in fact i was luckily drawn to a movie a documentary by uh back, which was made back in the 1980s by a fellow les brown and he talks about the physics of crystals. And he explains how when he happened to hang a crystal inside a pyramid, exactly by chance, in the place which was the kind of point of space where all the energy was condensed. And when he had hung it and he came back to earth, in other words, his body earthed the energy, he was chucked 20, 30 feet across the room, like, wow, you yeah. know? Yeah. we're not we're the, these these crystal guys are very awakened very intelligent and very much uh okay. you know um containing so much energy we have to we have to know what we're doing here this is not a joke uh, this isn't just to um okay let's try this let's try that we actually have to know what we're doing here well that's, it requires that's one of the things expertise it requires yes. expertise that's one of the things I love about this is that there's a there's a a, a call uh, an invitation into partnership with these energies right with this elemental energy with the biogeometric -geo energy with the energy the earth energy um, and it and it's going to require um, and cause I think in in the, for the people who experience it um, kind of a leveling up right <laughs> it's a, a leveling up of our consciousness. Um, I mean, for me, just till now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just till now, this has um, helped me uh, integrate and um, awaken a different uh, level of understanding of reality, you know? Yeah. We have to go, on the path, we have to go stage by stage, of course, like I mentioned, we have this classic outer, inner, secret, heart essence. And, you know, on the path, it seems that our existence introduces us to these different levels stage by stage. As we, as we need to go on, we will go on. The appearance comes to take us on into the next stage. And this is why I come back to the Rumi saying I put right on the first page 
of the presentation that you know when we walk the path the path appears right that's when we walk i would probably add another um word in there when we walk this sort of honest or true path I, this this path that is really in front of us we're not pushing things away we're not rejecting things that happen we're really accepting what happens in our appearance as being the the you know what has been offered to us as the fastest and swiftest path to our center coming back to this picture this latest picture of mine the tunnel vision eye of eternity how to cross that space how to cross that multi-dimensional space how to walk across the vortex dimensionally to get to the center we need a pathway mm -hmm. yeah and this pathway appears step by step i love that picture that you know the companies the roomy saying there how we are painting that path as we are walking it so it takes real honesty and real being where we are at the moment and accepting it yeah and I, and I think a a, a humility <laughs> um that we don't really that we haven't yet accessed as a species um but you know it, but individually i think we're getting there hopefully yeah allowing allowing that space oh. to allowing that appearance to appear and trusting in it and also sort of interacting with it yes you know please help me show me the way advise me give me the give me the tools show me the way asking yeah. because i do believe that we are interacting with a very very intelligent system i mean we are of course i mean it would be just in possible to say otherwise we are interacting with this incredibly intelligent system so intelligent that we couldn't even fathom what kind of intelligence this means yeah. and uh, saying please use me as your tool as this tiny little fractal of you in this uh you know within this appearance show me the way and i will do i'm willing i'm open i'm here i'm there you know just offering ourselves up yeah. and of course well, yeah you're right hey, community. Um, Lisa, I was just thinking of the next steps. Lisa said, create a model that's just big enough for a single person to sit in or stand up in and get an idea of how the energies would be. Is that is that kind of your next yeah. step or are you going straight? Uh, yeah, I think that would probably happen along with the prototype. I mean, first we need to figure out what and how um, we get this thing working. Um, which metals, which crystals, which shape, which angle, which this. I mean, there's a lot of testing to do here. It's quite mm. exciting. Yeah, a lot of shapes to deal with you know should this be more like this or more like this or you know of course you know i've just put it up there as a vision those are not exact angles those are not exact um you know the, exactly the way it will turn out it's got to be a working working thing and yes of course to test this uh the, the testing of the prototype will be the stage after we make a prototype so i don't know whether we first make the prototype in small and then make a larger prototype to test with uh, human intervention. Perhaps it happens that way. It but will yes, we be need healed. to test, 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 and test. Yeah, exactly. Well, I want to thank you so much for this, and I and I'm I'm very excited about it. I can't wait for you to come to the states. I I know um, the plan, as it stands, is to be in California at some point in the spring or summer, right? Um, well, it'll be, I think, summer, summer or autumn, because the uh, next uh, series of biogeometry classes, as I understand, will be announced after the special topics dates have been announced. Okay. So special topics is set for autumn, fall, as you say. Yeah. And um, the other classes are set for July. So perhaps. I don't think anything's really set, you know, Egyptian okay. time. Right. Well, we're just we're we're flowing with time right now. So, um, um, oh, Jerry wanted to let me know that he lost power in the storm uh, during the talk. So he wanted to talk to you, but he will not be able to talk to you this evening. Okay, um, no, problem. no problem. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you, Susan, for joining us from the future on Sunday morning <laughs> in the Himalayas. <laughs> and That's kind um, of a wild thing. Yeah, that's really wild. It? Yeah. <laughs> um, Yes, so thank you everyone for joining us and, and we will um this will be continued, right? Thank you. Okay. Thanks everyone. Have a good night. <laughs>